بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين Indeed, all praise is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We praise Him, we repent to Him and we ask His forgiveness and ask see for His help اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد My dear brothers and sisters جزاكم الله خيرا for coming here today inshallah as you heard brother Shazad saying this is our very first halqa on the Sirah and Tafsir classics. Uh, the aim, as we understand, is that to reunite Muslims just with, we, Alhamdulillah, we must have all read the Sirah before, but it's just to refresh our knowledge. And that's what we've tried to come over here for. Also empower our youth so that they can also understand this. And SubhanAllah, you know, in every profession, in every profession you tell me, we have to use and apply the seerah. It's, it's a shame that if we do not understand what the seerah or what the Prophet ﷺ, we claim to, we claim as Muslims that we love the Prophet ﷺ. But we must ask ourselves that do we really, really know Prophet Muhammad ﷺ as we should? So, the, uh, the, no, the effort, the humble effort that I'm trying to make over here is that to try and educate myself first and foremost and then you brothers and sisters about what and who the Prophet Muhammad was why he was the walking Quran as described by Aisha um, Inshallah we, we intend to conduct lectures on a fortnightly basis Okay, so it will be inshallah every Saturday pretty much on the same premises unless and until something changes and we will be there's a especially WhatsApp group that we will be notifying you uh, as to if anything actually changes at the last minute. So with that, I also want to describe, uh, sorry, discuss that uh, where my sources of the Sira classes will be taken from. Uh, of course, uh, alhamdulillah, I will take it from the books that I feel more comfortable with and what I have been studying in the past with. So it will be um, the main primary focus, and I would encourage the brothers and sisters. May Allah make us all have the zeal to learn the seerah, okay? To uh, purchase the book uh, called um, The Noble Life of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it's a beautiful book of three different volumes at least a good 2,000 pages so it's one of the most lengthiest, one of the most lengthiest and the detailed and one of the most authentic books out there It's written by an amazing scholar, Dr. Muhammad As-Sallami, okay? And it, is high, it was highly recommended by my scholars that's why uh, I chose to actually uh, teach you from this book. Also, I'll be teaching from, um, I'll be, there will be some sections that I will be focusing from the Sealed Nectar by Sheikh Mubarak Puri, and also from Sheikh Imam Ghazali, the Fiqh of Sino. So it will be basically the three uh, of these combination of these Sira books. So without any delay, I will start. As I was saying, male or female, uh, adult or child, scholar or a commoner, businessman or just a layman, a laborer. We all need to understand how the Prophet Muhammad chose the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, okay? And like I was just telling you a few minutes ago, that we, say, we tend to say that we love the Prophet we cannot know him just by reading his hadith. That is just a very small glimpse that we get to know about the Prophet It is the detailed seerah that you have to understand and then contemplate and then even ponder and implement in your lives. You know, practice makes perfect. If you do not take what we say over here and implement it in your daily lives, there's basically pretty much no use. And if you were listening to what the, uh, our young uh, students of knowledge were telling us, the point is to gather in classes like these, inshallah, is to also make notes. So as Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that if when you start making notes, you don't lose knowledge. We heard about the hadith of Prophet Muhammad that uh, if Abbas anha, encouraged, uh, Umar encouraged that we should be uh, uh, through the blessed lips of Prophet Muhammad that we should be making notes, okay, in the hadith of Sahih Muslim. So through the study of uh, Prophet Muhammad we tend to become the ideal ruler. 
we tend to become the ideal father, we tend to become the ideal businessman, we tend to become the ideal uh, educator, the ideal judge, and all these things Prophet Muhammad adopted in his life. If one needs to be an educator, or is an educator, whether, whether it's at home, or whether it's school, or in a university, or we need to understand who the best educator that has been sent to this whole entire universe by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll throw a question at you. Which uh, institution did the finest scholars of Islam ever graduate? We're talking about, hint, hint, from the times of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Can anyone tell me? What that house was called? Jazakumullah Khan. So the house of Al-Aqam. Darul Aqam. That was the finest institution that brought up the earliest Salaf al salihin Okay? So if one wants to be a leader, we need to understand how we should be uniting people. Because as we can understand, the Ummah at this time is divided. Everyone has their own, what we call, you know, in, in our languages, Jari Ajki Masjid, okay? So we need to rectify and unite the uh, Ummah. And how can we learn this? Because we will always see there will be adversities in the Ummah. There will be differences of opinions and thoughts. But hang on, didn't the scholars, didn't the uh, Sahaba have opinions, differences in opinion? But yet, they never shied away from the uh, path of uh, Islam. They, at the end of the day, their aqaid, their aqidah, their practices, they, their manhaj was pretty much the same, wasn't it? So, we need to understand as a successful leader, to opt the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu how he dealt with all these adversities and challenges. If one wants to be a scholar and he wants to learn the Quran, you do understand, brothers and sisters, that the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi the seerah, many, many events, obviously, were, um, many ayat were, um, were revealed because of the circumstances that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was going through. So, if one wants to be a scholar, you will note that the aqidah, the fiqh, the tafsir, all have taken small uh, little portions from the seerah. Okay? Now, if a Muslim inclines toward zuhd, what is zuhd? Zuhd means that abstinism, being to the, towards the extremism, okay, and avoiding all the things for the pleasure of Allah, uh, for, for worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But did Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa do that? No. He maintained a balance of life, okay? So he married, he prayed, he fasted, okay? So there was a balance of life. Not just the Muslim individual, we need to make sure that we as a nation adopt the ideology that Prophet Muhammad has presented to us in his brief life, okay? And especially his 23 years of preaching. And we, we look upon the rightly guided Khalif uh, Khulfa who used to sit with him and who used to learn all these jewels that Prophet Muhammad used to teach him and educate him. What the difference was amongst them and us is that whatever they would use, they had the zeal for knowledge, okay? But yet today, in this day, time and era, there's a lot of chaos. Our priority is dunya, dunya, and pretty much dunya, you know? And we all are guilty of that, okay? But look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to tell us in a beautiful verse of the Qur'an, Rabbana atana fi dunya, hasana wa fil akhirah. The dunya comes before the akhirah, okay? So, what I'm trying to say, the point I'm trying to make over here is that, yes, the dunya, the dunya should be very important, but simultaneously, on the same token, the akhirah needs proper due attention as well. Allah has promised those among those who believe, and has told that whoever does the righteous good deeds, he will certainly grant them succession on this earth. This is the blueprint that we need to be following in order for us to be successful as our early predecessors have been. We do not have the right to say that Prophet ﷺ and his companions were given these, all these miraculous things, okay? Had that been the case, brothers and sisters, as we all know and as we will study during uh, later in the classes of the seerah, it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have made such ease for him, just like he would have actually made the hijrah for him with so much ease, without devoid of any difficulties, without any challenges. He would have made the migration. Just imagine one second before I even go on. Think that you are living very comfortably in Melbourne. 
and one day you have been started to be, you and your family have been, you have started to have these persecutions in which may Allah protect us from, uh, from all of this. And you were asked to abandon, uh, be abandoned from your home, thrown into a different country. Think about the brothers and sisters in Burma, for example. How challenging it is for them to leave their own comfort zone. And not only that, they have been burned, they have been tortured, they have been raped, and all of these bitter consequences that they have faced. May Allah make it globally for all the Muslims a, a peaceful, a safe habitat to live in. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ and his companions, they went through similar persecutions. Okay? We cannot think about these persecutions because we are living in a very uh, comfortable lifestyle. Some of us are living in a very luxurious lifestyle. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to make things easy for Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he would have granted him just, right, uh, just like the night of Al-Mi'raj. It would be a one night journey and the Prophet sallallahu would have migrated from Makkah to Medina. Done and dusted, okay? But no, it is very unfair for to us to say that the Prophet sallallahu and his companions were given miracles and miracles after time. Yes, we can understand that. But there were many, many adversities that they had to go through. They had to endure hardship and they had to persevere. They were, they were always patient with, within themselves and within the Kuffar, the Quraysh, that they were, that, that, who were uh, continuously persecuting them, giving them a hard time. Even when they went to Medina, you, all, you and I all know, they, they, they thought they would be living and uh, um, they would have a new government of theirs, which they did, but obviously they had the polytheist over there, they had the, um, they had the Jews over there, they had the Christians over there, so new enemies uh, uh, in, in, in Medina now, even though they have actually tried to move for the betterment. So my dear brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say in this, in this preface is that in or why do we understand and why do we actually need to study the seal? For us, in a simple, very shortcut, in a nutshell, for us to become better Muslims, to have a better quality of life. And this will only and only happen when we take the information and we start implementing it in our daily lives. Just to give you an example, did you know how, do you think the Sahaba pretty much had, uh, they, they just thought about, they would just go to the halaqa of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and just learn the knowledge? They wouldn't do any business? Is that pretty much what their lifestyle was? No. Classical example, Omar bin Al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, he and his business, he and his, and, 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 and the, and his business uh, partner, they were companions, okay? And they were obviously businessmen. They lived a very busy life. Did you know how they actually coordinated? One day, Umar radiallahu anhu, he would sit with Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the whole day, and the commitment was that when he would actually retire at the end of the day, he would educate his business partner, this is what I learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then, the next day, his companion would actually, or his business partner, would actually go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then tell him, Ya Umar, this is what I learned from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. SubhanAllah. So this is basically how they encouraged, how they motivated themselves. Like I said, today we're going to be just starting with a very generalized um, description of what we're going to be doing in the seerah. It's very, very important to understand the background knowledge, okay? Before we go on to the second, um, second halaqa, which will obviously be a bit more interesting, okay? That's where we will try to understand the important life events just before Prophet Muhammad's birth, and then when he, when, when obviously how he was raised, and you know, obviously then it will be just more of a, uh, and an interesting kickstart, if you want to call it, okay? Now, we need to understand that there were dominant empires of the world before the advent of Islam, okay? The first empire that I would like to talk about real briefly was the Roman Empire. The eastern part of the Roman em Empire, the eastern part of the Roman Empire was called the Byzantine Empire, okay? And it included lands like Asia, we, we had a slide, uh, but inshallah next time we'll, we'll try to actually work on that. It, I, I could actually show you, showed you a better diagram so that you can get an idea. So it, the Byzantine Empire, it consisted of Asia, of North Africa, of Syria, of Palestine. So I'm actually imagining it from, from down below, okay? So Northern Africa, Egypt, okay? Syria, Asia, okay? 
Um, so these were basically the parts. And the capital of the Roman Empire, this part of the east, uh, eastern part of the Roman Empire was Constantinople. Okay, Constantinople. The, the very, um, the, the characteristics of this empire, it, it's a shame, okay, that the, this part of the Eastern Empire was very, very uh, wicked, okay? They were so wicked that they would subjugate, they would, Im they would actually, they would subjugate men, okay, and women, okay? And they had these evil tactics in which they would subjugate people. They would, they would debase people, okay? They, and obviously, like the most societies that I was talking about in the next few minutes, they used to make their men fight with the Persian Empire. So obviously, we, we, as I will talk about in a minute or two, the next biggest empire was the Persian Empire, okay? So Roman Empire and the Persian Empire, in order to have a reputation, they would fight amongst themselves, okay? Who wins, who loses? You know, it's time for egoism, eccentrism, okay? Just before I go to the Persian Empire, this Eastern Empire, the Byzantine Empire, we talked about the wickedness, they would be very cruel, for the, especially it's mentioned by Dr. Muhammad Salabi that the Syrian people, okay, they were forced out of poverty, that they would sell their children to feed themselves, okay? The farmers would flee from their houses and they would take refuge in places of worship so that they would not be persecuted. And I'll tell you in a, place, a second why they would actually flee to take uh, um, uh, security in places of worship. The Byzantines, they had religion deeply ingrained in their minds. So they were religious, okay? Notice the contradiction now, okay? They were religious people and they had religion deeply ingrained in their minds. And monasticism was widely uh, spread at that time. Monasticism, okay? They would enjoy some weird kind of uh, hobbies, okay? They would make stadiums that would hold 80,000 spectators or so, okay? And you know what they used to do in these stadiums? They would actually ask the most strongest people to come and fight till death. Or, even to make it more interesting and appealing for the people, they would let beasts enter into that uh, arena and ask the most strongest ones of them to fight and see who actually wins, the beast or the man, okay? So just, you know, very horrendous kind of activities that they used to actually take place in that kind of society. Now, who used to take the edge? Obviously, the rulers and the high classes, the elite people, okay? They used to make the most out of this. The second empire that was dominant at that time, it was the Persian Empire, okay? Now, the Persian Empire was bigger in size, was greater in size, it was more stronger than the Byzantine Empire, okay? And there were two religions that were followed at that time. It was the Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianism, and the Mithraism, okay? So Mithraism and Zoroastrianism were the two religions that were practiced at that time. The kings of Persia, they used to think about themselves that they, they actually acted upon impunity. Impunity is a concept that they were free from punishment, okay? Because they thought that they were descendants of God. So there was a lot of polytheism in the Persians, okay? And we will later discuss about this inshallah as well. Because they descended from the, they thought they were descended from the God, obviously you can think they were arrogant. They were arrogant and then they were uh, very lavish. They had a lot of extra extravagance, okay? And they would spend like anything. Okay. Obviously, they themselves had, you know, subclasses, okay? And obviously, like, just like the Roman Empire that I talked about, they had their higher classes, and obviously the kings, they used to be the most dominant. It was a poor lower class that used to be uh, at, at the hands of these kings. Then there was the Indian Empire. Before the advent of Islam, there was a lot of what we call jahiliya in India, okay? Uh, there were women were sub were uh, were um, they, they they were pretty much like merchandise. Okay, uh, they had this concept that if the men, their husbands, they died, they would actually burn themselves. Okay, many of them would actually take this and adopt this policy. If they didn't choose to do that, they were not allowed to marry someone else. So if your husband uh, has passed away, you're done. That's it. Okay, 
they were forbidden to marry. They, uh, the, the, and, and one of the most very classical hallmarks of the Indian system was there were classes. There were uh, what we call, um, there, there was a basically a caste system, okay? It was leaded by the Brahmins, okay? The Brahmins were basically the religious scholars and they were the priests. So they were actually in the top of the hierarchy. It was followed by the Kshatriyas. The Kshatriyas were the warriors, okay? These were the fighters. It was followed by then by the uh, Visyas. The Visyas were the merchants. They were the traders, the businessmen. And then they were followed by the Sudras. The Sudras were the people who were pretty much in the lower part of the hierarchy. They were the, uh, the, the, the laborers, you know, the servants, the slaves. And the last part of the tier of the hierarchy was basically the untouchables, the achut, okay? These people were obviously, as you can understand, in the hierarchy were the most debased. They were pretty much having no rights. Whoever talked to them, you know, was considered as a taboo, okay? So this was, and pretty much it is a sad thing that up to now, uh, practice in India, okay? So these were the major dominant empires that were before the advent of Islam. You have to understand this because we will inshallah talk about this later on. And like I said, I want to adopt a strategy, inshallah, bi'idhnillah, that I want to explain, I want to dig into more minute details because I know, alhamdulillah, uh, there's a lot of competition going on and subhanallah, I, I, I have, I'm, I'm very humble, okay, in the sense that I am nowhere according to what the scholars are, mashallah, teaching at Sira classes right now. Uh, I have a long way to go, inshallah, but I will try my best. All errors are from my side and from the shaitan. And all the blessings, all the good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So please forgive my errors, okay? But we will try to actually dig into and go into the depth of the seal. I plan, maybe subhanAllah, we might go up to 70 to 100 lectures of seal, okay? Uh, um, depending on how we go. Like I said, the book is pretty much, alhamdulillah, 2,000 pages plus, okay? All right, now we will go to the synopsis of what the dominant religions before the advent of Islam were. The first religion that I would like now uh, we, I would like to talk about is the Christianity, the Judaism, the Hinduism, the Buddhism, uh, and there was a religion called the Majanism. Okay, we'll focus on these real quickly. Before the advent of Islam, my dear brothers and sisters, the whole world was pretty much soaked into polytheism. There was a practice. There was a practice that was known in all religions. If you want to call something that was very common in all religions, that was the used to worship many gods. Be it Judaism, be it Christianity, be it Hinduism, okay? All of these shared pretty much these kind of shirk, okay? So the line of prophets from Ismail السلام, to the ascension of Prophet, Muhammad, uh, Prophet uh, Isa السلام, had pretty much been ended, okay? And we do understand that, that Prophet Muhammad came many, many uh, hundreds of years later. But till this time, we're going to be talking about now. What happened in this time frame was that the Christ in Christianity, the concept of Trinity had been widespread. Okay? The formation of the church was built. Okay? So this was nothing what Pro Prophet Isa السلام, preached. Okay? The concept of Trinity was doctrined. Okay? And the church was built, okay, which obviously had different teachings from the pristine teachings of Isa alayhi salam. The entire world was in darkness, and like we said, polytheism was the main thing. As for Jews, even their Talmud, which is their sacred book, attests that there were many idol practices done, okay. If you will recall, in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Musa alayhi salam was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come and worship him 14 nights. And brother, he, uh, Musa alayhi salam left his brother Harun alayhi salam with the, with the Jews. And even at that time, can anyone remember which animal they actually took to worship? al baqarah okay? So idol worship was ingrained even at that time. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them time to time, you know, all these subhanAllah blessings, be it from Manu Salwa, being rise the dead and telling what, who actually killed him, be, be it, uh, you know, uh, raising up the tour and, you know, giving them, uh, you know, asking for the testimony, 
being, you know, uh, uh, bringing the dead from alive, okay, to witness the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet, the Jews have, had always been very ungrateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Moving on, Christianity was the second religion that I chose to talk about, which Dr. Muhammad Salabi tells in his book, and it was characterized by a lot of um, polytheism, okay? Any person in the Christian religion who died would be taken as a martyr, as a shaheed, okay? And his statues were, would be resurrected, okay? The priests were taken as intermediaries between them and God. This is something like that the Quraysh also chose to uh, adopt as well, okay? Before the advent of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and even during his time. And the, the Christians, they would worship the saints and the martyrs, okay? Another religion that was uh, very um, uh, dominant at that time was Magianism. Okay? Magianism was a religion in which they used to worship elements such as fire, water, okay? the sun. They would actually worship the, the sun four times a day. Okay? And they would actually have houses of worship in which they would light it up with fire and used to make sure that the fire would not be extinguished okay? and would keep that fire away from water. That was basically their beliefs, okay? And like I said, they worshiped the moon, the fire, uh, and the water, okay? Buddhism, that was another very prevalent religion at that time and era, and it was prevalent in, in India and in, mid in, in Central Asia, Asia, okay? The Buddhism, they used to worship idols, okay? And wherever um, their priests would actually go, they would actually build many temples, okay? Then again, polytheism was celebrated. All in all, the nutshell is polytheism what, as it, was, at, was it at its huge peak. Now we move on to what the characteristics of the early Arabs were, okay? And what their civilizations root from. There were three types of Arabs that have been classified by genealogy. One of them are the al baida Arabs, okay? And they consisted of Ad, Thamud, Hadramud, okay? And Jurhum. The second one were the al Riba Arabs, and they were also known as the Kahtanias, okay? They were dominant in Yemen, which is the southern part of Arabia. And the third one were the Adnania Arabs, okay? The Adnania Arabs, they descended from Ismail alayhi salam, okay? And um, from uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, obviously, um, his son was Ismail alayhi salam. Ismail alayhi salam's son was, uh, one of his sons was Adnan, okay? And that's where, the, uh, where our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa progeny is directly linked to, okay? So the Adnania Arabs are the Arabs of the north. And which Arabs are the Arabs of the south? Kathania, that's right, okay? So Adnania are the north and the Kathania are the south. I'm just revising this because inshallah we'll, we'll speak about this a lot in the later uh, future halafat, okay? Ismail alayhi salam and his children, so what, what happened was uh, the Adnania, they were basically, they, uh, they were from Makkah, okay? Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he left Hajar alayhi salam in Makkah with Ismail alayhi salam, Ismail alayhi salam settled over there and the people of Jurham came there as well. Ismail alayhi salam married amongst uh, one of the women of Jurham, and that's how they were more Arabized, okay? That's how the Arabic language came into play, came into existence, okay? The most no noteworthy of Ismail's alayhi salam, like we mentioned, is Adnan, who has a direct forebear of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, okay? And after Adnan comes his son, Ma'ad, Ma'ad, okay? And then Nizar, and then his two children, Mudar and Rabia, okay? There's a hadith, in Sahih Bukhari, in which the Prophet uh, in which, sorry, Zainab bint Abu Salama, uh, radiallahu anha, she was asked, do you think the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from the Mudar? And she answered, replied in the affirmative, if not from Mudar, then from where? Okay, so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam from was, from, uh, from Mudar. Now, we talk about the Quraysh, okay? The Quraysh were the descendants of Kinana, Kinana, okay? And this was from the great grandsons. Grandsons. His name was Fahir. Fahir ibn Malik ibn another ibn Kinana. So there's a chain going on. Okay. 
Then there are tribes of Quraysh, okay? And there, these tribes are, I'll go, I'll jump actually into the ones because obviously we don't have to remember all of these. These are just because, you know, alhamdulillah, we're just trying to actually go through the very basic overviews. The sub-tribes of Qusay ibn Kilab. There were three, three sons, okay, of Qusay ibn Kilab. One was Abduddar ibn Qusay, Abduddar ibn Qusay, Asad ibn Qusay, and Abdul Manaf ibn Qusay, okay? Abdul Munaf was then divided into four subgroups, and there were Abdul Shams, Nufail, Abdul Muttalib, okay, and Hashim. It is from the household of uh, Abdul Muttalib that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And Abdul Muttalib's son was Abdullah, and Abdullah gave, rise, uh, gave birth to, um, was the father of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Okay, so the hadith, uh, from Sahih Muslim is this is what we need to take away from all the genealogy that I talked about make it nice and simple Okay, the Prophet Sallallahu said indeed Allah chose Kinana from the children of Ismail Okay, and he chose Quraysh from Kinana Okay, and he chose the children of Hashim from Quraysh and he chose me from the children of Hashim That's all you basically need to know. Okay, Now we will go on to the religion uh, at, at before the advent of Islam, Islam. And we did discuss about this, but now I'm going to be more focused about the Arabs. The political and the legal structure of the Arab societies before the advent of Islam, as we talked in a nutshell, was totally in chaos, okay? And the Arabs, this is very important, brothers and sisters, Arabs, they used to glorify and blindly, they used to blindly follow their tribes, okay? They would do anything in the, term, in their, in, in the name of their, of their tribes, okay? Of the, the, um, the tribes which they used to originate from. So killing for them would not be an issue. If any one of them was affected, they would, the whole tribe would actually rush towards, okay? And try to defend this person, okay? No matter if he was right or wrong, okay? So that was the jahiliya that they were going through, okay? And they used to worship the three main idols that we will just keep it nice and short were the Manat, the Laat, and the Uzza. Okay? The Laat and Uzza were basically the main idols that the Quraysh used to worship. The also in Khazraj, uh, we talk about, uh, which we'll talk about in Medina, they used to worship Manat, okay? mainly. So a lot of polytheism going on in this Sahih. Bukhari, Imam Bukhari, he mentions that Abu Raja al Taridi, he said, we used to worship a stone, okay? This is how they used to be. They used to worship a stone. And if they found a better stone, they would first, they would throw the first one away, okay? And they would hang on to the second one. And when they didn't have any stone, what they would do is, they would pick up some uh, sand, okay? And bring a sheep in, okay? Pour in some milk, okay? And make a stone uh, out of there, okay? Out of that clay that they were basically, you know, they had. So this is what their concept was of uh, having gods, okay? And obviously, they would justify themselves, oh, you know what? If we have to actually follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to uh, be, be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, these are the intermediaries that we have to actually reach to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without that, Allah won't listen to us. May Allah protect us from these kind of uh, shirk. I mean, so only remnants, only very small a group of people were following the true um, uh, religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, okay? And at that time even, the, we talked about that Quraysh was the dominant do, uh, uh, tribe in, in, in Mecca. Everyone used to respect them, and we'll come down to that in a second. There used to be annual pilgrimage, there used to be annual hajj at that time, but there was no piety in that hajj. It was a time of being boastful, of being arrogant, how well you're going to be worshipped, oh, so uh, subhanAllah, I'm going to be feeding so many people, this is what the Quraysh used to do, okay, that's why they were very arrogant, we're going to be looking after everyone, this is what, but mind you, besides being arrogant, they used to be very, um, they used to be very generous, okay, keeping, so it was a mixed combination, okay, arrogance and generous at the same time as well. So the pilgrimage to Mecca had no consistency of any piety. It was basically arrogance and boasting, okay? 
And obviously, the religion of Arabs was basically taken from the neighboring countries, and they obviously uh, had taken it from, they borrowed a lot of the religion from the Brahmins, okay, and from the Buddhists. Now, despite widespread arrogance and polytheism, I would mention a couple of names who used to be still following the, they were Hunafa. Why were they Hunafa? They were, they were following the true religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Okay, one such Hanif was Zayd, Zayd bin uh, Amr bin Nufel. Zayd bin Amr bin Nufel, okay? May Allah have mercy on him. He used to avoid eating any dead animals. He used to avoid um, taking association in partners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he had the right aqidah in him, okay? And that was one name. And there was another name, uh, Qis ibn Sayyida Sayyida al ayadi in a hadith, uh, it's, well, not actually in a hadith, uh, Ibn Abbas, عنه, he said that this Ibn Sa'ida, he would preach to his people in the marketplace Ukath. So there were different marketplaces. One of them is called Ukath. Okay, Ukath was a marketplace and he used to preach there. And he used to give, uh, tell the people of, of, um, um, of his times that there will be a person and he used to point in the direction of Makkah. He will be coming from that direction and they will be good from him. The people used to say, Yaqis, what are you talking about? What is this goodness about? And then he used to say, there will be a prophet that will be coming. If I were alive at that time, I would actually follow him and be the first one to embrace his religion. He will talk about the right way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Qis um, actually did survive till Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa time, but at that time, uh, he actually passed away shortly, but he did not uh, see Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam becoming, he, uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not accept, uh, not have the revelation till that time, okay? Now, we move on to the political situation of the Arabian Peninsula. There were two types of liver, dwellers. There were two types of dwellers, okay? One were the Bedouins, the nomadic people, who would actually go from one place to the other. So they didn't actually have a certain place, a, a, a area that they used to live. So these were the nomadic people, they were the nomads. And then there were the city dwellers, okay? As we talked about, there was a lot of tribalism. There was a lot of, um, you know, sense of associating with one's tribe and going to the extent, okay? So this was the Jahiliya that was going through. A tribe was basically a group of people that were linked to each other through blood relation. So they had blood relationship and that's how they categorized themselves. Now. On top of each tribe, there was a chief, okay? Now the chief, well, um, he had, um, this is gonna be interesting, okay? He, he would be obviously rightly honored and obeyed, but he had a lot of monetary rights. Any one fourth, any spoils that were taken from war, because there was a lot of war going on, one fourth would be his, okay? And he would pick and choose the best, okay? This is mine, this is this, this is good, you take the rest, okay? So this is how you used to do, cherry picking, okay? Having said that, he used to be very kind as well. He had to be very kind. He had to be very gentle to his people. He had to be solving their issues in times of peace. And at times of war, the people of his tribe, they would expect him to be in the front lines, not just at the back foot, okay, and just relaxing, okay, uh, partying. No, this is not what the, tribe was, uh, the chief of the tribe was expected. So he had many obligations if he wanted that one fourth and, you know, then pick and choose. Both the nomadic people and the city dwellers, they had to abide by the tribal laws and customs. Whatever the tribal chief had decided, that's it. That's it. You can't decide anymore. Okay? One thing that I would like to tell over here is that um, wars were just, you know, it was basically, it's kind of like, uh, it was more of a hobby. Okay? They would take uh, wars just for personal motives, okay? Remember what I just told you a couple of minutes ago. They would take war if, if, if some, someone from the, so for example, this is a war, this is a tribe, okay? And I, someone amongst us is the chief. So if, if you have a problem with someone else, okay? All of us would be going and fighting, okay? And then there would be a major war and that would go on. Just for personal motives, okay? So just really jahiliya. Economic situation of that peninsula, of the Arabian Peninsula. As we know, the, mo the vast, majority of the Arabian Peninsula, it was a desert island. So you can forget about thinking about the agricultural areas. 
obviously except for some parts of Syria and some parts of Yemen. Okay? Apart from that, it was basically a lot of uh, desert area. So there was no agriculture. They had to depend on their camels and their sheep okay, to pretty much uh, survive. But mind you, I just told you, they had to survive on something else as well. Looting other tribes, okay? So that's how they used to make their bread and butter, okay? Um, now, even though they were very, um, you know, they were at the back end of agriculture, they were well advanced in one thing, the Arabians. Can anyone tell me what it was? Trading, okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had um, situated Arabian Peninsula in such a way that it was between Asia and Africa. So there was a lot of trade that was going on, okay? And obviously, it was basically the city dwellers that would actually participate in these trades. Now, listen to these rules, this, um, my dear brothers and sisters. It was so ridiculous that if you were not from the Quraysh, you were obviously not well respected. Why were the Quraysh respected? Because they used to live in Makkah, and Makkah, Makkah was a sanctuary. It was a, it was a very blessed place. Okay, everyone had to respect Makkah. Okay, and because they had to respect uh, Makkah, they would respect these who the Arabian tribes, the other tribes. Okay, they would respect by default the Quraysh. They would not attack and loot the people of Quraysh. That was a big no-no. You cannot touch the people of Quraysh. Quraysh, if they were to take their trade caravans, no one touches them. But if you're a non qureshi then you have the right to pretty much loot and, you know, uh, attack others, okay? So Quraysh had a lot of uh, freedom in order to move around. The Quraysh, they would actually send two caravans in one year. One was pretty much at the time of summer, okay? And that summer caravan would go to Syria. And the one in the, no uh, uh, in the winter time would be to Yemen, okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described this in Surah Al Quraysh. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Li ila fi Quraysh. Ila fihim rihlat al Shita'i wa al Saif. Fal ya'budu rabba hadha al Bayt. Al Ladhi yat'amahum min Jum'ah. Wa amanahum min Khawf. It is a great grace and protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the taming of the Quraysh. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah so that the Quraysh can actually ponder that they are specifically mentioned in Quran. And mind you, my dear brothers and sisters, we'll talk about this in tafsir. Whenever the short surahs of the Quran come, they, um, they are basically from the Makkah origin. Okay, they were revealed, from, uh, revealed in Makkah. Because of the fact that the Quraysh, they did not used to listen to the Prophet sallallahu they used to cover their ears when he used to recite to them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent great poetry in those uh, verses of the Qur'an. And he made it deliberately short so that the Quraysh can actually listen. It was later down in the Medina period that the long surahs were revealed. So that a lot of fiqh, a lot more aqaib were actually revealed in the Medinan period. That is one very distinguishing period that I, uh, thing that I want you to distinguish between the Makkan and the Medinan surahs. Moving on, um, I was just translating you the, uh, the, the Surah Quraysh. So, a great grace and, uh, 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 great grace and protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the taming of the Quraysh. Okay? The caravans that the uh, Quraysh used to take set forth, they were safe, okay, that I just mentioned, in winter to the south and in summer to the north, without any fear. Okay, because the other tribes, they always used to be fearful of vandalism, of robbery. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So let them worship Allah, the Lord of the house, the Kaaba in Makkah. He who has fed them against hunger and who has made them safe from fear. Okay, that's of the people of Quraysh had. Now, there were three markets at that time. Ukav, we talked about this a few minutes ago. Okay, and there was Majinna and Dhulmajaz. This was the center of the marketplace where the Arabs used to come. And not only that, this, uh, this they, there used to be a lot of poetry that used to be uh, said in the, uh, that used to be practiced in these areas, okay? So, a lot of great poets, they originated from these marketplaces, okay? And there used to be a lot of competition, a lot of healthy competition going on amongst themselves. 
because poetry was one of the most uh, cherished things that the Arabs used to possess, okay? And we'll talk about that in the, in, in the next few minutes. Let's talk about the Arab society now. In Arab society, there was no limit, we talked about this, there was no limit to degree that the people were faithful to their tribes, okay? And their ancestry. So there was an obsession, okay? My grandfather has said this, that's it, khalas, we're not gonna listen to you. Second thing was, they were obsessed with eloquent speech. Does that ring a bell now? Why the Quran was revealed at that time? They were obsessed with eloquent speech. They loved anyone who was actually eloquent, okay? They just were just, you know, they were just pretty much really lured. They were mad about it, okay? And they loved the purity of the language, okay? So, and this was a reason for, because they wanted to actually, see, when you have an eloquent speech, you want to pass it on to your next generations. So they were thinking about their posterity, about their lineages to come, okay? They, they admired this as a very noble thing, okay? And that's how lots and lots of wonderful poets and speakers originated from the Arabs, okay? You know, in these modern day countries, uh, we have, you know, the footy is a very big thing, the cricket is a very big thing in South Asia, okay, for example. This is one of the most amazing things. You know, oh, you're from, you know, Pakistan, you're from India, it must be cricket, you know, you guys must be experts, okay? But that, at that day and time, if you are a poet, subhanAllah, that's it, you know, that's just well done. You've done, you've done the job, you have made us proud, okay? Women, let's talk about women. They were treated like merchandise in the Arabian society, okay? They were looked upon, a very looked down upon. If a man died, his wife would be passed on to his son. Obviously not the original mother. Uh, they used to marry countless uh, wives, okay? So it would be gone, uh, the, the mother would be passed on to his children, okay? And this practice kept on going on, obviously until Islam was, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade that, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا and marry not women. Whom your fathers married. Except what has already passed. Indeed, it was shameful. And most hateful and an evil way. Also, women. They had no right of, and the women and the children, they had whatsoever, they had no part of inheritance, okay? So all their wealth, they would be, that would be taken, and that would be given to um, the people who were fighting in, the, in, in their tribalism, okay? Whenever, whenever they had wars. That's how they actually treated the women. Also, if, you, if someone had a daughter at that time, it was a very shameful thing for them, okay, to have daughters, because they understood the fact that at that time, that, for example, if they're captives and women had to be taken, they would be treated as um, intimate objects, okay? Uh, they, uh, the women could not earn as much as men would, so obviously then again, you know, they're debased, okay? Women did not have a right in society, it was men all the way, so, and, and they would be treated as prostitutes, okay? So, some of them, okay? So this was, this was very um, sad for the father to receive news that he actually has a daughter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that and when the news of the birth of a female child is brought to any of them, his face becomes dark and he becomes filled with inward grief. So it grieves him that his daughter has become actually, he's been given a daughter. And many fathers, they chose to bury their daughters, okay, just because of this. And they would actually bury their daughters as well because they actually feared that if they actually took daughters, they would actually become uh, they would actually go into poverty. So they wanted to get rid of daughters, okay? So amongst them, do you remember we talked about Zaid ibn Am ibn Nufail? Okay? He was a righteous person. And he actually used to go to these people who used to choose to bury their daughters and say, look, 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 look let's let's compensate. I will take your daughters and I will actually raise them and once they're you know old enough you don't have to worry about them I'll, I'll just you know marry them I'll send you know make sure that you know they're properly they're looked after okay so this is what he used to do okay this was his practice also I would like to tell you about the focus on what and how marriage took place 
It's related from our, our from the mother of all believers, Aisha radiallahu anha, that marriage at that time took place in four forms. One was the form that exists today, that a man, he goes to the father, and then he actually proposes to for his daughter, okay? And then he would pay the dowry. That would be the first kind of marriage. The second marriage was the marriage of istibda, okay? Uh, sorry, before that, uh, the, 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 there was a second form of marriage in which once the uh, wife, she got cured from her periods, okay, the husband would actually send uh, her to have intimacy with another man. And when, because obviously he couldn't, you know, they couldn't conceive in that marriage. So he would actually send his wife to another man and they would um, have intimacy. And when he would actually get the glad tidings that she's actually uh, conceiving now, okay, he would, ref uh, he would, he could actually have the option of resuming his intimacy with her. And when the child would be born, okay, obviously he would keep that child, and he would do this for the fact that he would have a noble lineage. That was the other form, okay? And this was actually the marriage of Istibda. The third marriage was, it, it, one after the other, other it gets more uh, disgusting, okay? Fewer than 10 people in number. Fewer than 10 people in number, they would enter upon a woman, okay? And one after the other, once the woman uh, was conceiving, okay, she heard the news of uh, that she's now conceiving, she would, after her delivery, after a few days, call those 10 people back, okay? And all of them had to agree that you have to come. And then she would say, you all know what you did, okay? And then she would choose from amongst one of them and say, you are the chosen father, who she would love that person to be uh, the child's father. So that was the third form of marriage. The fourth form of marriage was actually even one more step forward. There were unlimited men that would actually come to this woman, okay? So and so woman, okay? And they would have, they would have intimacy with, with her, okay? As a matter of fact, she would actually put a flag outside her house that, you know, you're welcome, okay? And uh, there, were, there would be intimate relationships, okay? And then when the child would be born, they would actually have people called kafas. Kafas, kafas would be people who were considered considered to be expert, okay, in deciding that you know this child actually bears resemblance with falafala, okay, and then they would actually give that child to that uh, that 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 child would be considered the son of that father, okay. These were the four common marriages mentioned uh, in a hadith of Sahih Bukhari. Then there was the marriage of Muta, okay, which in our uh, religion obviously was abandoned by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay. So there was a nusk of this, okay, and it was considered lawful in the early stages of Islam, okay. It was considered as a temporary marriage. It was a contractual marriage, okay. Then there was another form of marriage in which it was basically trading, okay. There was trading, okay. There would be a, a contract between parties, okay, you take this, I take her, okay. We trade. Um, then there was another marriage called Nikah Ashigar. Nikah Ashigar was a father would have a daughter and he would ask another father who had a daughter, let's exchange our daughters, okay, in terms of marriage. So the father would get the other uh, daughter from the father and he would give his daughter in, to, uh, to that father, okay. That's how they would actually consume it, okay. There was no dowry in this marriage, okay. And in those pre-Islamic days of, er uh, uh, of um, ignorance, two sisters could be married to the same man. Okay? So, does anyone know uh, at any time and era who was one of the prophets at that time it was considered as okay? As, as uh, obviously, it was considered as jais if you want to say. Can, any tell, can anyone tell me? Yaqub alayhi salam. Okay? Just on a side note. Okay? So obviously this was then abrogated when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came, okay? That you cannot have two sisters at the same time in your marriage, okay? One has to die or you have to divorce or whatsoever, okay? That, that, that this marriage has to take. Now, another thing that was very typical at that time and era was that a man was allowed to take back his wife after divorcing as many times. So it was basically a game, you know? Okay, I, I divorce you, go back to your parents, I take you back again. 
okay? And this kept on going unlimited times. You could divorce your wife as many times as you want. So it was more of like, you know, it became more of like a hobby, okay? I divorce you, I don't, I marry you. I divorce you, I marry you, okay? And obviously, uh, with the advent of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed, Al-Talaq Marratan, the divorce is twice. After that, either you retain her, or on reasonable terms, you release her with kindness. This is what the Sharia was uh, implemented. We talked about it. war was a constant reality at that time, okay? And this was obviously because of the environment that the Arabs had their upbringing, okay? Just to give you a very, uh, uh, one, one small example, there was, uh, there were two tribes, Abbas and Thibian. Abbas and Thibian, okay? In these uh, tribes, there were two people, okay? And they owned two horses. One horse's name was Dahis, and the other's name was Ghabra, okay? So they both had these two, um, Qais had, he owned Dahis. Qais was a man from this tribe, and he owned Dahis, a, a name of a horse. And Hudayfa was, he owned a horse called al Ghabra. okay? So there was a horsing competition. What happened was, I mean, I'm just trying to tell you that war, how it took them, how it took minimal effort to start a war. They competed their horses, okay? Now they were a little bit cheeky as well. On one side, uh, uh, the case is told that you know if, if one of the horses is leading, you shoot that horse down so that my horse can actually win. This is exactly what happened. When one of them actually saw that one of the horses is actually overtaking them, they shot the other horse and he landed in the screen. Obviously, the other horse would have won, right? As soon as the other person found out this is being you know this is what we're doing right now, this is pure cheating, it would turn into a major war. So it took minimal reasons, very subtle reasons, very trivial reasons for them to start war, okay? And Arabs at that time, before the advent of the Prophet wasallam, had almost 100% illiteracy rate. They were very, very few handful of them who were educated, okay? So the majority of them didn't know how to read and write. The last but not least, I'll touch upon the manners and the morals of the Arabs, okay? We talked about that they were very promiscuous, okay? They had a lot of intimate relationships, okay? They used to shed blood like water, okay? okay. Uh, they gambled a lot, they stole, they fornicated, okay? Uh, they usurped the wealth of their women, okay? Uh, and and th there was a lot of fornication going on, but mind you, very f rarely did free women Respectable women indulge in this, okay? So free women did not indulge in these kind of activities. There's a hadith that at the conquest of Makkah, when Prophet Sallallahu was taking barrier from pledges from the uh, women, he said, do not associate any uh, worship other than Allah. So worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala alone and be chaste, okay? Do not enter, do not fornicate. So Hind bin Utba, the wife of, Abu Sufyan, inshallah, we'll get to know all of these names very much. So Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anh, she said in surprise, and do free women fornicate? So, yeah, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So basically, it was, you know, a bit of a, a kind of actually surprise to her, you know? So free women did not fornicate at that time. And obviously, let's put this as on the side note as well, not all Arabs, they used to indulge in all of these evils. They were good people as well. And now we're going to talk very shortly about what the goodness they had as well in them. They had a natural intelligence. Even though they were, they were illiterate, they were very, very sharp and intelligent people. To give you an example, they would memorize 500 different names that are meanings of, well, words, sorry, that would describe a lion. 500 words. There are actually 500 words in Arabic that describe a lion, okay? There would be 200 words for fula fula. There would be 1,000 that would mean camel, okay? And they had such sharp memories and such uh, detailed understanding that they would memorize all of that. No, it is no wonder that the Sahaba could easily memorize and understand what uh, 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 when Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to teach them. Okay, they could memorize the Quran. They could memorize thousands and thousands of hadith. Okay, a second quality of the Arabs was they were very innocent as well. They had some innocence in them as well. Okay, 
and they were not convoluted by the superstitious beliefs and ideologies that the Romans and the Persians would have. Remember this, brothers and sisters. Romans and Persians at that time, they had lots and lots of polytheism going on, okay? And this was the edge that the Arabs actually had in them, okay? That they were not indulged in these convoluted, in these spoiled, in these disgusting beliefs. And it was thus more easier for them to have the uh, correct aqidah instilled into them, okay? They were very generous. If a person did not have anything for his guests at that time, he would slaughter a camel and he would serve near his guests. So they were very generous people. They were very brave people. They used to keep, they used to praise that person who would be considered as a martyr. And they used to kind of actually despise, well, kind of despise if a person died a natural death. So they were brave people, okay? They loved their freedom. Remember this, they loved their freedom and they hated humiliation. They could, you know, it was their ego. They could not be considered, they wouldn't consider humiliation. An example is Amr ibn Hind. He was the king of al hira okay? Amr ibn Hind, he was the king of al hira and he asked very arrogantly, is there anyone uh, who, to his companions, is there anyone who would refuse to serve my mother? One of his companions said, Amr ibn Khutum, who is a poor poet, is one of them. So he said, the king said, okay, you bring Amr uh, ibn Khutum over to my house, and bring, uh, my palace, sorry, and bring his mother along as well. I want to check them out. So when the, king, uh, when the, the king's companions would have served the food to Amr ibn Khutum and his mother, when they had finished, the king ordered his mother, ask Amr ibn Khutum's mother to serve you the tray. So Amr ibn Khutum's mother said, the one who is asking should help herself. Okay? This is Amr ibn Khutum's mother. The one who is asking to the, queen, uh, to the uh, king's mother should help herself. I'm not going to help you. Okay? And then the king's mother asked her twice, serve me the tray. And she goes, no, the one who is asking. Now she's actually telling, the, uh, she's yelling at the top of her lungs. The one who is asking should help herself. Okay? I'm not going to be subjected to this humiliation. And she then says, oh, um, what humiliation, O Taghlib? Taghlib was her tribe. And when her son actually heard this, he actually took out a sword and slaughtered the, uh, in one blow the king's head. Okay? So what I'm trying to tell is that they were very subject to humiliation. Their pride was very first and foremost in them. Okay? And then the Arabs at that time, they were very truthful. They would keep their promises and they were honest as well. In general, they tried to avoid any lying. Okay? For example, the most famous thing that I can quote you is Abu Sufyan. When he met, uh, when he was on the outskirts, okay, he uh, for traveling, okay, he actually met Hirakal, okay, and he and Hirakal asked him, "What kind of man is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam?" Mind you, at that time, Abu Sufyan uh, was Abu Sufyan. He was a polytheist, and he was a bitter enemy of Islam. He could have chosen there and then to say lots of negative things about Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But he actually chose to tell the truth about the kindness, about the mercy, about all the noble things that Prophet Muhammad possessed in his charactership. Okay? And there's a hadith that Prophet later he explained, which is mentioned in Sahih al Bukhari, that had it, oh, Abu Sufyan says, had it not been for me being shy, had it not been me for being shy of them ascribing a lie to me, of the people ascribing a lie to me, I would have told a lie. But because he was an Arab, he chose to tell the truth, just because of that. It wasn't anything about Islam that interested him, okay? They were very faithful. They were, ex we talked about this in detail earlier, okay? And they were very patient in hard times, okay? They looked upon the person who would eat a lot. They would eat, uh, would have finished their meal. It was a custom for them to say, not Alhamdulillah. They would say, Glutty, gluttony upon, gluttony does away with intelligence. Gluttony means that, you know, your ex excessive eating. Excessive eating makes you dull, makes you dumb, okay? So that's what they used to say when they would finish their meals, okay? And obviously they would pretty much uh, live on low supplies of water. They had rocky mountains. All of these habitats make them very strong and patient, okay? And they would, last but not least, they would show mercy. Whenever they had the upper hand to take opportunity to kill their enemy. 
they would not actually do it. They, were, they would be at times, most of the times, they would be generous, okay? SubhanAllah, look at this, my dear brothers and sisters. Today we talk about the generality, about the uh, dominant empires, the Persians, the Romans, the Indians, okay? The, Gre uh, uh, the Greeks, okay? These were all the dominant empires at that time. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He chose our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be raised in the Arabs, okay? This was the honor, the privilege that they had that made them far more exalted, far more elevated from all of these dominant tribes that were prevailing in that time. So it was a very due honor by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Prophet sallallahu was raised and brought up at that time. And because of this, they developed sound inherent nature Okay, they were prepared to receive, embrace, and disseminate the message of Islam. Inshallah, with this we, we will conclude our first halaqa, and the next halaqa will be the important events that took place just before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam.